Hello, I'm Dr. John Lang, Associate Professor of Theology and Philosophy at Southwestern Seminary's Houston campus. We at Southwestern are committed to biblical authority and inerrancy, and we teach the scriptures as the foundation for all Christian life and decision making. The study you're about to watch is a multi-week study of the book of Hebrews where my wife and I co-teach a Sunday school class at our church at Nassau Bay Baptist Church and we uh, are going to teach it from a verse-by-verse -verse standpoint so that uh, folks will take God's Word and apply it to their lives. This is what we teach our students at Southwestern to do so that they teach the full counsel of God to, the, to God's people. Uh, one of the things we like to say is before you can know what God's Word means to you, you have to first know what God's Word means. And so rigorous study of the text of Scripture is the key uh, to, to walking with God and to being able to teach it and minister in accordance with its teachings uh, to others. If God has called you to prepare for ministry, whether that be lay ministry, teaching Sunday school, uh, or whether that be vocational ministry, pastoring a church or, or ministering on staff in some capacity, or a ministry outside of the church walls, like chaplaincy, I'd invite you to consider Southwestern Seminary in Houston. Our campus is located one mile north of Hobby Airport on Broadway Boulevard near the intersection of I-45 and 610. It's my prayer that this study of Hebrews will be a blessing to you and that you'll learn from it and grow closer to God. May God bless you. <laughs> okay, so last week, uh, last week we, we did an overview of the book of Hebrews and we talked about the, the uh, major themes and emphases that are in the book of Hebrews. And of course, uh, you may recall, I was going to say, of course you remember. <laughs> okay, you may remember that uh, what we said, the main emphasis of the book of Hebrews is the deity of Jesus, so identifying the person of Christ, and, uh, and then talking about the work of Christ so that we Christians will have confidence as we uh, approach God's throne, we'll have confidence in our salvation, and uh, also so that we will not fall away in the, first, in the face of persecution. So, that's the, the overall argument of the book of Hebrews, and those themes, uh, like I said, are recurring throughout the book. It's like, Jesus is, is great, so don't fall away. Jesus is better than this person from the Old Testament, or these people from the Old Testament, so don't fall away. Jesus is exalted, so don't fall away. Jesus is your Savior, so don't fall away. Jesus suffered like uh, many of the prophets did. So, when you suffer, don't fall away. These are, these are the themes that we'll uh, continue to see as we work through the book of Hebrews. So, we, we read through chapter 1 last week. I don't think it'll hurt us to read through it again, so we're going to do that in just a moment. But um, you'll recall we, we began talking about some of the affirmations or the, some of the images used to talk about who Jesus is in Hebrews 1. And so let's read through it again from beginning to the end of the chapter. So verses 1 all the way through 14. And then uh, we're going to bring up an, uh, or point out a number of these images. So as you feel led, please read. And if you can, read loud enough and clearly enough for the video. Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he became higher in rank than the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have become your father. For again I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he again brings his firstborn into the world, he says, and all God's angels must worship him. And about the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants a fiery flame. But to the Son, your throne, God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. 
you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. This is why God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy rather than your companions. Somebody else, verse 10. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? Okay. Now, obviously, he just asked a rhetorical question, and that's going to lead us into chapter 2. So next week, we're going to, we're going to back up a little bit into chapter 1 just to read uh, the follow-on argument from chapter 2. Okay, well, what did you notice about what we just read? Anything, anything stand out to you in uh, this first chapter? How high Christ is and how, okay. and how low the angels are according to... Christ. Yeah, here there's primarily a, a, a comparison of Christ to the angels, and it's an exalted picture of Christ, and he's saying the angels are low. Now what's interesting about that is think about, uh, think about the, the, the way the angels appear in the Old Testament. Okay? When an angel appears, how, how is it usually depicted? Or, to put it another way, how do the people who see the angel typically respond in the Old Testament? Fear. Great fear. Fear. They fall down. Sometimes they pass out. They cover their eyes or their face. They, they try to worship them. And the angels are like, no, no, I'm just a created being. I'm just a servant of God like you. <laughs> right? And so they're, they're de the depiction is something, you know, it's not like little... You know, little babies with angels, uh, with wings, I mean, you know, <laughs> flying around. They're uh, pretty frightening beings. Uh, clearly and obviously powerful beings. Uh, you know, spiritual beings, but powerful beings that, uh, that in, induce fear in people. Even people of faith, you know, very faithful. I mean, these are people who, you know, God chose to reveal things to, you know. Uh, to, to use as his prophet. So these aren't just, you know, your average, everyday, uh, you know, follower of the faith. These are very faithful people. And they're, you know, making the mistake of bowing down to worship the angel. I mean, sometimes they, they must think it's God. I mean, that kind of a, of, a, of a depiction. And yet here he says he's far above the angels, right? So already we have uh, an immediate, exalted picture of Christ, right? But the other thing, the other thing I, I was kind of driving at here, and I, I probably didn't ask the question in such a way as to lead you where I wanted you to go, uh, was it, is this. There, there are several references to the Old Testament here, right? He keeps saying it. Like, to whom was it said this? And, uh, you know, it reads in the Old Testament, it said this, and the, the prophets said this, and God in the past said that, all about Jesus. So he's referring the readers back to uh, what God has said in uh, the Old Testament text about Jesus, or explaining that some of the things that are written in the Old Testament actually refer to Jesus, even if when uttered, they were not understood to be, uh, you know, prophecies about Christ, you see? So, uh, so we're getting here in the New Testament, by the revelation of God through the writer of Hebrews, we're getting insight into uh, how God's plan was always and from the beginning for Christ to be the Savior. I kind of, I kind of was, I guess, I guess I kind of, it's, it's, he's writing to the, the Hebrew people, right, the Jews. To, to me, they, they have a concept that Yahweh is the highest rank in the universe, and right below Yahweh are his agents, the angels, and there's nothing in between. It's almost like he's now introducing this person that comes in between the angels and Yahweh. Well, and there's even and there's even a sense, I mean, if we think about it, like, and, and the interesting thing is, by the way, he doesn't say, to the Jews, I write this, right? I mean, the, the book has come to be named Hebrews because of, when you read it, um, it seems that it has a lot of concerns that the Jewish believers would have had. In other words, it's addressing a number of their concerns, right? So, as Robert said, he's writing to 
Jewish Christians, right? So, uh, and of course, the quotation of the Old Testament in multiple places is one indicator that that's, those are the people he was writing to. There are other things too, lots of talk of the tabernacle and so forth that we see later in the, in the book. Um, but, you know, what Robert, Ro what Robert's saying is true, although I would say it even, it's even more stark than that, right? You have, you have uh, as the Jews would write it, right? they write it like this, because they don't want to even say God, right? But we'll go ahead and say it, right? The, the divine name, Yahweh, Yahweh, you may have seen Jehovah, Right is another way because Y in German is J, and they translate it into from German. So that's where just this is a little side note. That's where Jehovah comes from. So oftentimes when you put in vowels, a lot of people will call this Yahweh or Yahweh because we can't speak without vowels in English. So Yahweh. So the God, right? God is highly exalted, and and the way Robert expressed it was you have God, and then you have the angels. Right, who are these powerful beings, like we just mentioned a moment ago, right? Scared people and so forth. Yet, in reality, the Jews would even see it like this. There's God, and then there's the creation. And this is what, let me throw, you want me to throw a little philosophical term out for you, just for fun? This is what we call ontology. That's just a fancy way of talking about being, or to put it more clearly, ways of existing. Okay? Now, wh why do I bring this up? The point is that God is so, here we're talking about like, God is so far above everything else. He's, a, he's of a different order, right? And then you have creation, where you have the angels, and of course, you know, humanity, the earth, and so forth, right? So, so you have this, and yeah, now the, the writer of Hebrews is saying, oh, Christ is not just above the angels, but far above the angels, and we'll see that what he's going to end up saying is, he's up in this realm, right, in this realm. And this is why we're gonna, what we're going to see, when, we, when you really take this, this concept that there is God and then there's everything else, right? When you, when you take this understanding of, of the type of being that something is, right? Whatever it we're talking about, whether we're talking about the earth, cars, humans, or angels, right? We're all the creation or the creator because we all came into being from God's uh, spoken word. God himself is the creator. Well, and, and so he's creator, we're creation. See? So this sharp distinction then is going to be uh, is going to be even more, is going to bring out even more clearly Christ's exalted status as deity, right? Because what we're going to see is it says he is the agent of creation, right? Christ is, right? And it's right there in verse 2. So we already talked about this last week, how he was the heir of all things, right? The one who's going to inherit everything that is, that, that is God's purview. Well, what's that? Well, everything, <laughs> right? Who has a rightful claim on all that is? Well, only God, the Creator, does. Yet, it says that Christ will rightfully be the heir of all, right? Again, just in saying that alone, already we're talking about Christ as not in this realm as a creature, but in this realm as Creator. But just in case we didn't get that, you know, we don't just because just in case that sort of slipped by us because we didn't understand what how significant that title of being the heir of all things is. Um, then he goes on to say there in verse two, right? In these last days, he's spoken by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Right here, you have he he made the ages, made all things. And in fact, like I said last week, the, literally it's not cosmos, like the universe, but in, in Greek, literally the word there is the ages, right? So that brings in, it, it, he uses the word made, right? Brought into being, created. So it, it, 
speaks to him as the creator, or let's say agent, of creation. Why would I put it that way? Well, because it's the Father who creates through the Son, by means of the Son, in the power of the Spirit. We can go back to our Trinitarian understanding of God, right? The Son is the Word in John. And in Colossians it says He is the agent of creation. Same thing here. Through whom uh, God made all things. But the interesting thing is when He says He made, so we have this, this aspect of being the Creator, but we also have another aspect that applies only to God. I probably need to erase this and make this a little more clear, but you have eternality, right? Because he made the ages. He didn't just, you know, make stuff. And this overcomes some of the heresies. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, this overcomes some of the heresies that were prevalent in the early church, where, whereby uh, some, uh, some of the uh, groups would say that, well, God creates by sending forth a part of himself, and then and it's a little bit lower than him, and then another part comes out, and another, this is sort of like the, well, this is a, an easy way of describing what the, the so-called Gnostics believed. You may have heard of them. Uh, I know in, in our class we've talked about them some. Anyway, all of that just to say, uh, we don't need to go into all that detail, but it's just to say that when it says that he created the ages then, it brings in just another aspect of his deity that we might not have picked up, uh, but he, he uses that word uh, to, to speak to, to his et eternality, or his eternity. And this is important because, again, in the early church there was a debate about whether the Son was, uh, while the agent of creation, through whom the God he created, he was still yet the first creature, right? And this is what the Arians argued for. And uh, the modern-day Arians, just to put it in today's terms, Jehovah's Witnesses believe the same thing. They'll say God created the Son, and then through the Son created all other things. But this is not what Hebrews says, right? When it speaks to him creating the ages, it says, There was not a time when he was not. <laughs> now why would I say it like that? Because one of the catchphrases for the, that early heresy, the Arians, was there was a time when he was not. Right? In other words, prior to the sons being created, it was just God. But here, he says, not the case. Okay? Alright. Anyway, moving on. That was just point number two. We got like him. So, uh, what else does it say about him? It says he's the radiance or the brightness of God's doxa, God's glory. It's kind of like doxology. You guys ever like sing the doxology in church? We don't really do it in this church so much, but uh, you've heard of it. Right? So, the the, doxa, the the doxology means that it's the words of glory. <laughs> So, literally, right, the, the speaking of God's glory. So here it says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. Right? He's the, ref like, it's like he's the reflection of the brightness of God. Okay? Now, why would that speak to that? I think that speaks to his deity as well. Why? Well, because who else, who else could be the, uh, the radiance of God's glory? Well, only God. Someone else might be able to function as a mirror, you know, bounce it off. Some people think that's what Satan was doing in heaven before he fell. Um, anyway, we don't have time to get into that. But, uh, but he, would have been, he would have been merely reflecting what was proper to God, right? But this, it says, he is the brightness of God's glory, right? He's not reflecting it. He's not, it's not like a, a passive, you know, bouncing off of him, but rather he, he himself is this glory. Yeah, he is equal to it. Or, or uh, when, when Christ is revealed, the glory of God is seen, if you can put it that way, right? Well, whose glory is the glory of God? Obvious, right? It's God's. <laughs> so, so uh, again, you know, it's proper to God. And it's proper to Christ. You see? 
So again, another proof of Christ's deity here. Okay? The believers are, you know, let's say in eternity, would we not be the same thing though? Would we not be the radiance of God's glory? Well, it says that we will be made like him, and we will share in him. So, uh, you know, some of that, I think it's, it's, we are, ours is a derivative, right? Uh, a derivative exaltedness when we, by union with Christ, right, in salvation. So when we talk about, like, the revealing uh, of the sons of God at the end of time, or when God remakes things, you know, at the resurrection, we'll be resurrected in glory, right, and in power, but it's a derived glory, right, by our union with Christ, whereas Christ has it proper to his being. We just participate the in it. Right. So we're participating in his glory. You see? So, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, 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 the, the interesting thing is then when we talk about salvation and what it means for us to be united with Christ, it's a pretty pretty big thing. You know, to, I mean, it's, it's more amazing than we usually speak of it in church. I mean, and, and I'm just as guilty as the next to say, you know, I'm forgiven of my sins. Well, yes, you are forgiven of your sins, but why? Well, because you've been united with Christ, who is God himself, right? And you've been made a co-heir with Christ. A co-heir of what? Well, yeah, I mean, it's pretty amazing. I'm getting chills now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get charismatic on you here. I'm going to start dancing around up here. You know, nobody will know. Nobody will know except all Except everybody on YouTube. And, you know. All right. Order a copy of that. All right, well, I said almost. Uh, okay, um, what else does it say, though? It, I mean, it goes more. I mean, you know, just right now, we haven't even looked at the Old Testament passages. I mean, we probably need another week. My wife's telling me to hurry up. So number four, it says he's, uh, in, in verse three, what does it say here? Somebody read this, because I want to see if, if other translations say something different. In verse four, mine says, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, in verse three, it says, he's the radiance of God's glory. And, and mine says, the exact representation of his being. Okay, does anybody have something different there? Yeah. His nature. Exact his nature. Exact representation of his nature? Yep. Okay. The exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Okay, exact exact expression of his mine, nature. Okay, so we have... Mine says, yeah, mine go ahead. says the express image of his person. Or reproduction. Express image. Holding all things by the word of his of his person. Exact representation. Uh, exact we had expression. Expression. Yes. expression. Anything else? Exactly. Reproduction. Oh, Yours says a reproduction. It says an exact expression or reproduction of his nature. Okay. Wow. Or reproduction. Okay. <clears throat> What was your her, your hers was a little longer. The express image of his person, but I didn't. I read uh, holding all things by the word of his power. Yeah, I just read the first image uh, of his person. person. His person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, okay. I'm going to tell you. I, I, I know sometimes you guys feel overwhelmed with all the you know Greek words and you know ontology words and philosophy words, but let me give you a Greek word here for what it means by exact representation. The Greek word uh, that is translated that way is, okay, you ready? Character. <laughs> it's character. I got um, it. I mean, I guess if you say it in Greek, character. No, it's character. <laughs> character. Yeah, that's right, character. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> all right, so character. All right, so... <laughs> Um, you know, I, I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm going to do a word study on this because, you know, we know the, the, how, how the word is used in English, right, how it's come to be understood, right? When you speak of the character of someone, what are you speaking of? Their person, their, kind of their personality, but sort of a reflection of who they are in their sort of, not, not being like I'm a human being, but in like sort of like as... Uh, you know, the essence of who I am as me, you know, maybe is the way uh, we might use it. Um, so I thought I'd do a word study. The problem is the word only occurs once in the Bible, <laughs> in, at least in the New Testament. It occurs, well, 
in the Catholic Old Testament, it occurs three times. In the Protestant, it only occurs once. So it's twice in the, uh, in the Apocrypha and uh, once elsewhere in the, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So we, we, we're not really able to find a whole lot um, about uh, character. But, um, but what, I, what I think is interesting is most, most scholars have understood this to mean something like the exact... Uh, reproduction or exact representation of his being. Yet, I think what's interesting is the, the concept of character brings out like not being in the sense of ontology like we were talking about, but rather his like personality, right? I mean, when you speak of someone having good character, usually you mean they're kind of like a moral person and they're a, a good person, like the kind of person you'd want to be friends with or have to know or to have on your side because they are, in, you know, good in who they are, right? And so what's interesting is when it talks about then him being uh, the character of God, right? Uh, when you look at Jesus, you're looking at God in his person, like who he is, right? Um, so again, it speaks to, I mean, who else is like God? I mean, what, what's interesting is, when, again, think about it from that, that Hebrew perspective. Think about it from the Old Testament's perspective. There is no one comparable to God, right? In fact, it's kind of, it's blasphemous, right? I mean, you're blaspheming if you compare God to anything. This is why you can't even make images, right? Um, and yet... Here, the writer of Hebrews says, he is the character of God. You look at Jesus, you know what God is like, right? It's kind of like, if you know Jesus, you know God, right? Um, you know, people say, no Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. Um, um, but um, I would say it like this, you know, no Jesus, no Jesus, no God, right? And that's what, that's what the writer of Hebrews is getting at. Um, the, the way the word character was used in, uh, in the ancient world, like outside of the Bible, they used it to talk about the image on a coin. They'd say the, the image on the coin is the character of whoever it's supposed to be. So like Caesar. So when Jesus says, whose image is on this coin, right? And they ask him, should we pay taxes? Right? It's the same idea here. It's almost like whose character. He doesn't say the word character, but that's what he's saying. Okay? Now, it says he's the, the, the character of the, and then we had person and being and nature, I think, were the three words used to translate. Okay? The Greek word here is one that probably won't mean much to most of you, but if you've heard of the debates in the early church over the son's relationship to the father, right? There was a big debate. Like I said, Arianism, right? Some said he was not one with the father. He was derivative of the father. He was the first creation and so forth. Those were what the, that's what Jehovah's Witnesses say today. Modern day Arians. So. All right? In Arianism, there was a big debate about the nature of... Uh, Well, the nature of the person of the Son to the Father. Um, so, the word, the word that came to be recognized was, He is of the same essence. Now, here it says He is an exact representation of the... The hypostasis of God. Now, you might say, well, what does that mean? When we speak of the Trinity, right, what do we say? There's one being, three persons, don't we? You guys remember, we, we talked about this in our Sunday school class some when we talked about modalism. Do you guys remember us talking about that, some of you? Okay, one being, three persons. This word here is the word that came to be used to refer to the threeness of God, the hypostasis. There are three hypostases. So, uh, but it's a word that has more substance than just 
mere uh, like mere roles. He's not just a role that is being played, but it's just, it's got substance to it. So the son is the exact representation of the person of God, right? So he's the the character of the person. To put it in English terms, he's the character of the person of God. Uh, again, a very high Christology here. We could, I mean, I could talk a lot more about this, but I want us to, to move on. But you get the idea here, right? The, the character of the person of God. Okay, so he's, uh, he's the heir of all things. He's the agent of creation. He's the reflection of God's glory. He's the character of the person of God or the nature of God. And... Then um, it says in verse 3, right, he sustains all. He's the sustainer of all, right? It says he, like he upholds it all by the power of his word or something like that, right? So sustainer. Now, again, throughout the Bible it speaks of God being the one who upholds all things, right, by his powerful word and the like. Um, so... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so he is, uh, he's the sustainer. Okay, number six. <coughs> he's the savior of all in verse three, right? What does it say? Um, after he had provided purification <coughs> for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Um, what's interesting here in verse three. <coughs> Okay, so it speaks of him as providing purification. Um, so it's, it's already beginning to talk about him as the Savior. This is going to come out more clearly later in the book. Right? So at this point, um, this doesn't necessarily, being right, the one who provides purification, it doesn't necessarily at this point speak of his deity. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it absolutely does. Though we'll see later the way the writer of Hebrews speaks of him as Savior, does speak to his deity, right, later. Uh, that'll become more clear. But at this point, he makes purification uh, for, uh, for all, right? And then it says, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty. So, here, there's some distinction, right, between who he is and who God is, the Father, right? So, what I find interesting here is it protects us against another heresy. Say, what do you mean? Well, again, in Christian theology, we believe there is one God who is three. Right? This is Orthodox Christian understanding. Right? And in this, all through here, I've been showing you how it clearly says, or it's clearly teaching that Christ is deity or is God. Right? But here, he distinguishes Christ from what he refers to as the majesty. Right? Which I would say is always understood as the Father or God. So the Son, right, he's already been called the Son, by the way. Right? The Son is not the Father, but he is deity. This is just a way of protecting Christian theology from the heresy of saying the Son just is the Father, which is what uh, what I just referred to a few moments ago, called modalism. It protects against that, and we've already shown how it protects against Arianism by clearly and uh, resoundingly teaching that the Son is deity. Right. So again, protecting against the two, er two of the earliest, not the two earliest, two of the earliest heresies in the early church, right here at the beginning of Hebrews. The other, uh, the, probably the earliest heresy was to say... Um, that Christ was just a man, right? The, the Messiah, just a man. And, of course, this also overcomes that heresy as well, which is the third heresy.
Yeah. So I wanted to point out that not just Arianism is still with us, but modalism is also still with us. Modalism is, yes. United Pentecostalism. You may have heard of uh, the United Pentecostal, United Pentecostal Church International, specifically that particular brand of Pentecostalism. Because in Baptist circles, we oftentimes think of Pentecostals referring to any charismatic group. But we're talking about specifically the United Pentecostal Church International denies the doctrine of the Trinity and instead says the Son is the Father, and the, the Son and the Father are the Spirit, period. There's no such thing as the three persons in the one being of God. Okay. But Orthodox Christian theology has always taught this. Right. Um, okay. All right, so are we getting a picture of Christ as deity here? <laughs> um, okay, in addition... It proclaims him as Lord of all. So he sits down at the right hand of the majesty. Who, who else would accept one who is accorded equal status with the Father be able to sit down at the right hand and rule in the Father's stead? I mean, that's what it says. You rule until you put all enemies under your feet. Right? This, again, hearkening to uh, the Corinthian writings. Where he talks about this as well. Okay? But it says, he's so he's Lord of all. In verse 6, then, it says what? And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Let all, he's, so he's the, he's the proper recipient of worship. Now, what do the angels say when people try to worship them? Don't do it. Don't do it. They say, don't, don't do it. Oh, no, no. It's like, no, 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 no. Get her, get her, get her, get her. Please, please, please. Did anybody see? You know, I mean, it's kind of like this attitude, right? They're like, whoa, wait, dude. Hey, you're way off, you know. Um, yet, with the son, it says he's, he's the appropriate recipient of worship, and not just any worship, the worship of the angels themselves, who the people oftentimes want to worship. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, pretty, that's a pretty strong statement. Right? Let the angels worship him. Um, also, uh, also in verse 8, it goes on to say what? Um, yeah, go ahead. Is this a quote from the Old Testament? It is. It is. It is. From Deuteronomy 32. 43. And it depends on your translation of the Old Testament whether it will be clear or not. Some, uh, many will have it in the footnote, <coughs> as in later manuscripts. No, Deuteronomy 32, 43. There are a bunch of others that are from the Psalms in here, as we'll see. Um, coming up. Mine also cites Psalm 97, 7. Yeah, but it's, well, anyway. Yeah. Oh. It, I, I know, um, when I looked it up, it doesn't, it's not clearly, it's like a, an illusion, possible, possible illusion. Um, well, okay, in, you know, I wanted us to have time to look up these Old Testament verses, actually, if we're not going to. But in verse 8, it says, About the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever. Okay, if, now, this is a quote from the Old Testament, right? But he's applying it to the Son, right? What's interesting, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever. Is that the end of, that's the end of class, isn't it? Okay, well, real quick. So, he calls him God in verse 8 which obviously, you know, drive home this point. Like, if you didn't get it up to this point, let's just say, okay, your God, your throne, oh God, <laughs> will last forever. It speaks to him being God. He has a righteous scepter, right? The righteousness will be the scepter, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. He has a kingdom. He is ruling. He is called God. He has the righteous scepter, and he is eternal, right? Uh, just in that one verse, just in that one verse. All of those things are brought out. And then in, uh, and then in verse 10, real quick, uh, the, last, uh, the last clear, um, exalted, 
uh, point about Christ. He says, he also says, and again, here he's talking about referring to the Son. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Um, and, then, uh, and then in verse 12, you will, you will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed, but you remain the same, and your years will never end. So, again, it speaks to his unchangeableness, right? Uh, he can't change, and he's eternal. His days will have no end. So, again, what, it, what other sort of being is unchangeable? Like what we call immutable or impassable, right? What other being? Well, only God. We're all finite. We're all changeable, and we do change. Right? Um, whether it's, you know, we're getting old and our hair is turning gray or falling out or, you know, things are not where they used to be uh, or things aren't working like they used to work, <laughs> right? Their ties or whatever. Or, uh, or whether it means that we, we develop over time because we grow, you know, as people. Yet God is already infinite. He doesn't grow, right? He doesn't change because he's already perfect, Right? Any, uh, right? So the idea here is, is he is the same. Well, it says the Son, right? To which of the angels does he say these things? He says none of these to the angels because they're creatures and they're finite and they do change and they aren't ruling and they're not called God, right? They don't rule with a scepter. They are servants. They're messengers. That's what the word angel means, messengers or servants. Um, so... Uh, so again, here when he talks about the Son in chapter 1, introducing the book, the Son is deity. He is God. He sits at the right hand of the Father and he's ruling. All of that, all of those realities, all those truths, he's unchanging, he's steadfast. All of this should inspire confidence in us who have been saved by him and are, as we were saying a moment ago, united to him. Right? Right? And that's what the writer of Hebrews is going to say. Now, next week, we are going to move into chapter 2, but we might look at just a few of these Old Testament references from chapter 1, just because I think it's important when he's quoting the Old Testament, he wants us to go back and look at it, or at least think about what it's saying, apart from just what he's saying. Right? So it might be interesting for us to take a few moments to go back and look at those passages. Yes, sir? I think it's important to know that because of the heresies in the first centuries, somehow the church was pushed to make those Christian creeds. Yes. And I want to say that at Nicaea, some of the ideas from the chapter 1 in the Hebrews are mentioned there. Let me read the just. We believe in one God, the Father, creator of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, as only begotten that is from the essence of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not created of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things came into being, both in heaven and in earth. I think some clarification is coming here against many of those uh, ideas who began to flourish in the first century. That's right, yeah. So these heresies were flourishing, like, like my uh, father-in-law said, the, the heresies were flourishing in the first century, and the church came together and... Um, and said, okay, we need to say what we believe about Christ because that's, that's absolutely important to what, uh, what we as a church believe. You know, we have to clarify this. And uh, like my father-in-law said, they drew upon the teachings in Hebrews and, and of course, Colossians 1 and Philippians 2 and, and John 1, but it's all right here in Hebrews, very clearly, I think, laid out uh, of who Christ is and what his relationship to the Father is. And uh, with that, uh, let us close in prayer.
Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness and your grace, and we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and uh, we thank you for the incarnation, and we thank you for the salvation that we have by union with him. And Lord, we do uh, pray that we would uh, continue to be awed by uh, your majesty, but also by your plan of salvation that you have uh, revealed to us in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. Pray that we would serve him each day, walk in your ways, and be faithful and true to your word. We, uh, we thank you. We pray that your blessings would be on our worship, and we pray your blessings on our lives and on our families. Be with the believers in the church overseas who suffer, who continue to face persecution. May they hold fast to the faith because of who Jesus is and because of what you've done for them. We, uh, we pray for them, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.